What's up, Nutrition Hero family? This is Dr. Brad Watts, and you're back with another episode of the Nutrition Hero podcast, where we're interviewing the industry's best when it comes to both the art and the science of functional medicine, clinical nutrition. So today, my guest is Dr. Mike Carberry, and Dr. Carberry is a founder and director of Advanced Medical Integration. He is a graduate, 1983. Guess who was born in 83? Right here. And uh, he is a graduate in 1983 in marketing degree. And so I'll ask a little bit about that, how that shaped uh, your industry, basically, as a mover and shaker in the industry. And then also, uh, I would very much like to hear the story about chiropractic in the 90s and how that has changed and morphed into what you're currently working on. So, Dr. Carberry, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. So I got to ask, 1983, what was this marketing degree all about? Were you a doctor at heart or what was going on? No, I had no idea I was going to be involved in healthcare. Um, I was going to school to learn how to run a business. That was my interest in my whole life, take a small business, and grow it into a big business. Um, a couple of things happened where I met my wife, who is a physical therapist. She specialized mm-hmm. in traumatic brain injury. That was my first introduction to healthcare. Um, her family very a very strong pharmaceutical background, two vice presidents of pharmaceutical companies in her immediate family. Oh, and uh, okay. while I was dating her, I had a very serious neck injury that almost paralyzed me. And mm. that changed my direction of everything. Um, started off medically treating first with pain medication was the goal. And yeah. after a few weeks of that, I was sick of it and um, decided to go to a chiropractor against everybody's advice. And you can guess the rest of the story. Chiropractor wow. fixed me. My wife became an instant chiropractic believer, and (laughs) I had an epiphany that this was the small business I was supposed to be in. So I went back to school, another six years of education, graduated in 1991, and uh, started my career. Wow. So slight detour, but oh my goodness. How happy were you to find that? Uh, I looked, when it happened, it was the worst thing ever happened to me. I look back, it's one of the best things ever happened to me. Yeah, wow. Funny how that works sometimes, right? It is. It It doesn't doesn't make you strong. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, tell me about your chiropractic clinic in the 90s. What was that like? What was your um, what was your jam? Well, I was so on fire to get people to get chiropractic care that my goal was to get as many people under chiropractic care as possible. So uh, I think in the first three years of practice, I was up to 425 visits a week and I had no associates. Um, <laughs> oh, I hired an associate in 1995, hired a wow. second one in 95. And by 96, we were doing 700 visits a week. Wow. So it was a gigantic practice. Um, yeah. We were flourishing. But what I noticed is people had problems that they assumed were new problems because the symptoms were their barometer. And when I'd go to look at their x-rays, I'd see an injury that was decades old. Hmm. When I'd ask them about it, um, they would say, no, I never got injured. And I'd show them the x-ray and they'd go, well, you know, I did get injured. I forgot all about it, but I was in a train wreck or a right. true story, fell out of a helicopter in Vietnam or uh, oh, most wow. commonly I was in a car wreck. Right. So then we got the epiphany. I'm married to a physical therapist. What better thing to do than to change the adaptations that have occurred over the last two years to this problem while we fix the problem. Gotcha. And that opened up a whole new world. And um, right. what we found out in the 90s in Pennsylvania, a physical therapist was not allowed to work with a chiropractor or accept a referral mm-hmm. from one. So our mm-hmm. only other option was to become medically integrated and have the medical wow. people recommend the physical therapy. That's how it started. Well, and I would imagine that in the 90s, there wasn't a lot of medical integration happening at that time. I had no models to copy. Um, you know, there was a couple guys teaching it. One guy was Ron Halstead and I didn't want to follow his direction because he ended up in prison. Um, <laughs> okay. and the other one was Dr. Dehan, and I didn't really feel comfortable with his because he was under attack for not having proper licensed doctors and clinics. And so we ended gotcha. up doing it the hard way by ourselves. All right. So sorting it out. In the first five years of doing it, we paid over a million dollars in legal research fees. Whoa. My yeah. goodness. So but as far he, as like – laying the foundation that was that was just hard fought foundation right there for sure what what doesn't kill you makes you strong <laughs> all right so how has the medical integration situation changed from the 90s to today 
Well, um, there's a lot of companies now teaching it, but I think the, the biggest thing that um, is missing from those other companies is the emphasis on patient outcome. The mm -hmm. reason we started that company, the reason we became medically integrated because we saw a need for more services to improve the patient outcome, not just to make more money. That was a side effect that we didn't expect. And when that's it happened, cool. like, oh, you mean we get paid for this stuff? Well, that's pretty cool. So, um, cool. yeah, I mean, and, and, and as a marketer, you were asking me about marketing earlier. Yeah. You know, marketing is all about perception. And it's not about my perception or my wife's perception. It's about our market's perception. And we've learned an awful lot over the last two decades about how patients perceive chiropractic and how patients perceive a medically integrated practice. I'll give you an example. We did a survey one time and we asked people, what do you think about a medical doctor working with a chiropractor? Mm -hmm. And the answers we were getting most commonly was, well, what's wrong with them? Gotcha. Then we switched around and said, what do you think about a chiropractor working with a medical doctor? And the most common answer we got was, well, it must be a really good chiropractor. There you so go. That's how we model. That's our model is we have a medical clinic with chiropractic as one of the tools. Gotcha. Very cool. That's a... A slight paradigm shift, but actually the semantics are, are pretty powerful with that. Well, you know, it was a huge paradigm shift for me because I was like this chiropractic to the world guy. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to really wrap my head around this. But what I realized is I will get more people under chiropractic care with that attitude than I will with a chiropractic office with a medical person coming in. Yeah, like especially if you look at the stats right now. Um, I just I heard this the uh, at a seminar the other day where they're talking about less than 10 percent of the population participating in chiropractic care. I would imagine that because of the way you're packaging the model, that that's being sent in a higher direction, not just serving the 10 percent, serving really the 90 percent. Oh, we market to the 90 percent. In fact, gotcha. uh, one of our medical physicians, one of our clinics like to go in and do the report of findings. And he said the most common question he gets in the report of findings is, well, that sounds great, Doc, but do I have to do the chiropractic? Gotcha. And he would just look at him in the eye and say, yep. Yeah, exactly. Go, okay. Gotcha. So, I mean, we're, our goal is to get people to realize chiropractic is a very effective, safe tool and should mm -hmm. be part of healthcare. And the patients who come out of our programs, that's exactly what they realize. Well, let's talk about some of the programs, um, specifically like cardiovascular or pain programs that you guys offer. What's that like right now and who are you serving? Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, the, originally the model was to bring in physical medicine to help people with mm -hmm. orthopedic and postural problems. But when you start to look at what a patient needs to be well, the two most effective things anybody could do to make a patient healthier is to get lifestyle changes with more activity or exercise mm -hmm. and nutritional change. And that's the two hardest things for doctors to achieve. Um, right. Medical doctors are not very trained very well in, in, in nutrition. Chiropractors are. So to bring that in is um, something we've always had a strong interest in. We've done some functional medicine in our clinics. We've had people trained in functional medicine, um, medical people trained in functional medicine, chiropractors trained in functional medicine, because we know that even if we're providing the right exercise and the right chiropractic balance and everything else, if they're not eating the right stuff, they got two strikes against them. Right. So rebalancing the endocrine system through nutrition is what, what our goal always was. Wow. Okay. So I understand that there's some cardiovascular testing that you guys have been implementing that in the marketplace, second to none as far as analytics. What is that? And um, if you can speak to that a little bit. Let me talk about that. We have a machine. And it basically uh -huh. checks three things. Um, it checks cardiovascular health. It checks the ability of the peripheral nerves to function correctly. And then it also gives us some indicators or precursors for diabetes. Um, it's a very accurate machine. And um, it tests the elasticity of the cardiovascular system. So Hey, that's cool. It is cool because yeah. when you have the ability to do that, um, one of the things for a, a vascular competency is you can predict um, sudden cardiac event, which is mm. the leading cause of death in the United States. Half of the people who die of cardiovascular disease die suddenly of a heart attack. There is no mm. other predictor that that is known other than this machine to pick up if you're wow. a candidate for that. 
So when we do these tests, we do these tests on our patients because we're going to put them into a rehab program. And mm -hmm. we want to know what the cardiovascular risk is. And then we want to reassess at the end, did we actually make a change? Um, right. So by doing these tests, we know what we're dealing with. We found that two out of every hundred tests that are done ends up in a life-saving result because it picks up on wow. things that we didn't even know they had. And we can get them right into the appropriate treatment, um, even, you know, not even in our office, but into emergency care because they're a walking time bomb, didn't even know it. So right. um, it's a very, very wow. important aspect of what we do. Now, once we discover if they have any of these problems with the neuropathy or pre precursor to neuropathy or cardiovascular health, exercise is a very important part of that, but it's not the only part. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, if you look at the, how a cell is structured, it, it's a lipo protein is the membrane of all mm -hmm. cells. And the lipo part, the fat part, is the elastic part. And if we mm. don't have the right fats in our diet, if we don't have the right nutrients in our diet, our cells are going to become hardened. And what usually kills people is not blocked arteries, but hardened arteries, the inability mm. to dilate or constrict and regulate blood yeah. flow to body parts. And you cannot That's correct a, that without a nutritional component. Yeah, that that right there is kind of like a metaphor for life, the inability to adapt, right? So. Exactly. Um, when you're looking at that style of support, how common are how common is this style of assessment in an integrated clinic right now? Um, it's a growing thing. Uh, mm -hmm. We we have a lot of people that don't do it, but more and more people are starting to do it. And we think it's the right way to do it because you really want to one gather the data so you can show how effective your treatment was, but two, it could save somebody's life. Right. So we feel like there's an obligation for us to perform these tests. That's, that's cool. why we do it. So one of the things I could see just being a functional medicine provider myself and in knowing that world is that if a doc is not necessarily up on the nutritional side of things, sometimes I would imagine that would be a little intimidating to be running assessments like that that require some level of nutrient intervention. Um, what's cool is I've been working. That's funny that we're talking about this because I've been working with uh, biogenetics, a company that I consult to, to develop uh, kits basically that are, you know, easy to follow programs. The doctor's only as good as their ability of the patient to follow through. Um, what has been your experience with doctors using those cardiovascular testing machines? Is it something that people are, are taking on as an easy revenue source and service center, or is it something that's, you know, intense as far as applications? Well, we brought it on for the reasons I said, for the mm -hmm. patient outcomes. Everything yeah. we do, number one reason to do it is patient outcome. The second reason we do it is it's got to be compliant. We mm -hmm. look at that. So we look at outcomes first, compliance second, and then profitability is just a bonus. Okay. Um, if, if you're not getting patients well, you're not going to have a good career. Right. So you have to focus on the outcome first. Um, the interesting thing you brought up is, is the aspect of nutrition can be intimidating to some doctors. Um, you know, I've studied a lot of nutrition. I wouldn't consider myself a functional medicine guru, although I've done a lot of continuing ed on nutrition. I've mm -hmm. actually studied functional medicine. I've had people with great credentials in functional medicine working for me in my clinics. Um, and we have a lot of clients that actually have trained very well in functional medicine. And they, they brought on our model to legitimize that the fact that the patient is coming into a medical clinic to get corrected. You know, one of the things we've learned over the years is you go to a chiropractor and a chiropractor corrects a problem that a medical doctor has failed to correct, that patient gets upset at the medical doctor and goes and blasts them. Mm -hmm. And then the medical doctor reports the chiropractor for practicing medicine without a license, even though mm -hmm. it's within our scope. And then the chiropractor has to defend himself. But mm -hmm. if it's done in a medical setting, it's harder for that medical doctor to justify doing that. Right. Um, and it will get their attention like these people did something different and got a result where I was not getting a result with the standard of care. So this model is the right environment for functional medicine. We have a lot of guys that go, I do functional medicine, but I want to put systems in place to have physical medicine going mm -hmm. at the same time that somebody else in his, in his entourage or his uh, ag establishment can run. So we have systems to do that. But cool. my nurse practitioner summed it up beautifully. You, you cannot change somebody without a nutritional component. And she pointed out to me, she said, you know, 
you look at cardiovascular disease, the best two things for cardiovascular disease, diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. You look at depression, best mm -hmm. thing for depression, diet and exercise. It rises or raises serotonin levels better than any drug out there because the drugs out there just trap the serotonin that's in the nerve. And it, it, over long-term use, it actually lowers the amount of serotonin. But if yeah. you use nutritional components combined with exercise, that's going to raise serotonin levels, and that patient's going to feel a lot brighter about things. Very we cool. had a medical doctor who worked with us in Pennsylvania who actually his specialty was psychiatry. And before I ever met him, he broke away from psychiatry because he said, they're a bunch of quacks. They just want to drug people, and he wanted to do it through nutrition. So he studied nutrition very, mm -hmm. very well. And he was listed as a psychiatrist. And in my clinic in Pennsylvania, we had a constant stream of psychiatric patients coming in. And he would say, I will not be putting you on medication. Right. Do this exercise component and these nutritional components. If you want the mainstream, we can refer you out. If you want to try something different, we'll do this. And about half of them stayed. Wow. Phenomenal results. Phenomenal. Wow. Results. Yeah. Wow. So... When you look at pain management right now in like a physical medicine setting, what is that like uh, just from an integration standpoint? Like what kind of services are you offering? Well, we're trying to get people to be functional. If you look at what's the difference between our viewpoint and a, a traditional medical clinic, sure. Um, instead of focusing on the symptom or the lab value, we're focusing on the function. Remember, I'm married to a physical therapist. And the way <laughs> yeah. a physical therapist looks at health is they go, if Mr. Jones can't ride in a car for 15 minutes or more without pain. Let's look at his body and find out what's wrong with his body and fix those things to see if we can restore that activity of daily living. That's how they establish medical necessity in a physical medicine model. That's what we do. But we know that nutrition is a component of that. The difficulty is this. If you're having a clinic set up on systems so it can be run when you're not there, I live in Oregon. My primary mm -hmm. clinic is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, 2,000 miles away. I have people there making decisions. And if they say, well, I'm not good at nutrition, well, one thing I like about the biogenetics program is they have these kits. You know, you got a cardiovascular kit. you got a pain kit. You have uh, different kits for different nutritional components. Even here you have a stem cell kit coming out. Mm -hmm. That yeah. makes it extremely efficient for these clinics to be able to put a nutritional model in which is one of the necessary ingredients to get these patients well. If you don't yeah. put the right stuff in, it doesn't matter how much you work out, you're still going to have problems. Right. So you're in a unique position, I would imagine, being in an integrated practice since the 90s. You probably saw the advent of the opioid crisis a decade ago. Absolutely. Uh, Not only that, I actually yeah. had to rescue a family member who got hmm. put on opioids, and when they took him off for an injury, he turned to heroin. And uh, this close to losing him. Now he's a counselor at Narconon, uh, saved mm. his life. But we're adamantly opposed to the opioid use in this country. It's way overdone. Um, yeah. The number one diagnosis for opioids is back pain. Did you know that? Really? Absolutely. Wow. So wow. Uh, our goal is to steer people in another direction and get them off the opioids or prevent the opioid prescription because it does nothing to improve function. Opioid mm. only squashes the, the symptom. Mm. And you know as well as I do, when you take something to stop a symptom, your body goes, well, then I'm going to turn that symptom up, and now you got to take more. Right. And uh, that's, that's the dead end or the dwindling spiral of taking opioids. It doesn't mm. lead to a happy outcome ever. Man. So one of the things that uh, I was reading, I was preparing for a webinar that I did on opioids and really a nutritional response to it is medicine, uh, medical researchers, I should say, have found something that they dubbed the pain switch. And what's interesting is that you can turn it on and turn it off based off of metabolism. You know, I've heard about that. And I've heard about that through Eric Huntington, Dr. Eric Huntington. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. You know, I've heard, I did a radio show for years back in the 90s with a compounding pharmacist. Mm -hmm. He also alluded to the same type of thing. But um, that's amazing if, if uh if nutritionally we could turn that pain switch off, what a fantastic thing. I mean, look at all the lives we would save. I think it's every 15 minutes somebody dies with an opioid prescription. Yeah, absolutely. 650,000 people they're projecting uh, coming up here in the next couple of years. That's that's intense. That's that's.
You know what I mean by that? So, sorry, you cut out there, doctor. Uh, um, I said the, the, the number of people dying from that is like we're at war. Oh, yeah. I and mean, that's the of those deaths. Yeah, that's it's insane. Um, what's interesting is that right now medicine only has a couple of tools that will shut off that pain switch. Opioids don't necessarily shut it off. They cover it up, like you were saying. Uh, but the other one is called methotrexate, and it's a cancer drug. And it's basically wow. suppresses the immune system. And what it does is instead of having like AIDS, like acquired immunodeficiency, this is right. induced immunodeficiency. So it's a situation that I, I feel like people are being put into um, unknowingly. Uh, but it's you'll see in the next five years, you'll see a lot about that one as well. Induced immunodeficiency syndrome. So intense. Right. Wow. So That's right now... Good. Right now, where do you see uh, maybe maybe your career is a good barometer for the chiropractic profession or maybe even the integrated side of the chiropractic profession? Where do you see it headed over the next decade? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, I hear a lot of doctors say the worst thing that ever happened is they raised the deductibles. And I disagree with that. Um, when deductibles were raised on all Americans, all of a sudden Americans started realizing if I have to pony up for the treatment, mm -hmm. I want to know what it's going to do. And they're being more selective. So, for example, like stem cells. Stem cells is right now considered cash. If we use a, a, a material like a amniotic allograft and we inject that into a joint, the idea is we're trying to get tissue from the amnion into the joint, which hopefully there are stem cells in there that are alive and you know, the results prove it. We have tremendously high clinical success rates, mm -hmm. no side effects, but it's a cash service because the FDA is saying we don't really have the studies to prove this. Right. And states like Arkansas are passing laws saying we don't care if you have the studies to prove it or not. We're going to cover all of our state employees and mm -hmm. their dependents, which is about a half a million people, for the use of stem cells in an um, arthritic condition. Because wow. it's going to save us seven hundred million dollars a year from mm -hmm. reduced surgical costs, and um, mm -hmm. you're going to see more and more groups like that, more and more states and government bodies starting to say, you know what, enough is enough. Our healthcare is the most expensive in the world with the least effective rate. Um, right. It's time to start looking at something different. The fact that Americans have to pony up for that bill now, they're starting to look for that as well. The number wow. of people that are willing to spend money on stem cells or nutrition in mm -hmm. functional medicine clinics, because we have a lot of clients that do that, they realize, you know what, Going, following the standard of care, SOC, or same old crap, <laughs> gets you nowhere. <laughs> uh, it's uh, time to do something different. And I think yeah. that's the wake-up call that America is starting to get. So actually, I'm very optimistic for the future. I that's think cool. clinics, like what, what you're promoting, what I'm promoting, is the future of healthcare. Our goal right now is to get enough clinics out there getting great results with patients in this model that the patients start to demand it from the insurers. Gotcha. I think that's happening already. Like, I think that there's some traction that's been uh, dug up, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, and you're seeing, I was just at a conference in Florida the other day, the largest chiropractic convention in the world. And, it's interesting to see some of the services that people are promoting um, as covered under insurance now, which means that like the insurance company is not going to just walk out and be like, hey, we're going to decide to cover these five things today. They're responding to the demands in the marketplace. So exactly what you're saying. That's pretty Well, they sweet. have to do that. If you look at the agreement between an insurance company, it's, it's a triad. It's the insurance company, the patient, and the doctor. And as mm -hmm. a doctor, a lot of times we focus on that side of it. But they're promising the patient that they'll keep their activity of daily living to a certain level. Hmm. And uh, they have an obligation to do that. And the patient can decide to go buy somewhere else. Hmm. So uh, if um, they don't respond to it, it'll be the death toll for the insurance industry. Yeah. Interesting. I think that might be happening in Ohio right now. So yeah. um, anyway, yeah. when we look at um, the integration aspect between medical doctors and chiropractors and you look at physical therapists right now in a in a perfect clinical setting, what's the percentage of activity in your clinic? Uh, meaning, is it 33 percent across the board or is each one have their own specific niche that they're responsible for in an integration? We collaborate. We're truly integrated. Integrated means integral parts all making up a whole. 
-hmm. So we work together on every patient. We don't assign things out to different people. Um, it's led by the medical team. We have a team meeting before every shift. In that team meeting, all the different professions sit, they review all the new patients and all the re-exams, which we do every two weeks. And they collaborate with their expertise and their viewpoint on what they think is the, the, the thing that is needed for that patient. Mm -hmm. And then the medical person makes the final decision. So it makes it a true collaboration. Um, yeah, and it actually is creating a medical team at that chiropractic is an integral part of, which is our goal to get it so that healthcare shifts its focus from symptom based to function based. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you look at cardiovascular disease again, um, you know, the, the, if you have cardiovascular problems, you go into your doctor, he's going to look at your cholesterol. He's going to look at your blood mm -hmm. pressure. If your blood pressure is out, he's going to give you a drug to bring it down. If your cholesterol right. is high, he's going to give you a drug to bring it down. But there's never been a study that actually said cholesterol levels that are high cause heart disease. Right. The studies say they happen at the same time. But it could mm -hmm. be the heart disease is causing the cholesterol and not the other way around. And if you look at the drugs they use to lower cholesterol, one of their side effects is heart attack. Right. So you go, Where, exactly. where's the logic in that? You know? <laughs> right. And as Americans are becoming wiser because they're being forced to pay for some of this bill, they're yeah. starting to realize this and say, you know what? I don't know if I want to be part of that. Yeah, that's I think that I think that your style of practice, especially with the diagnostic capabilities that you're talking about today, um, it's going to be front and center coming up in the next five to 10 years. 800,000 people this year is being projected for a cardiovascular incident that ultimately takes their life. 800,000. That's just in yeah. the U.S. That's incredible. And that's up from just a couple of years ago, which was 650,000, which means we're not yeah. getting better. We're getting worse. Well, exactly. So, and it's, um, to me, when you talk about that medication model, especially with statin medications, there's a, uh, a growing body of research that is going to be directed towards patient outcomes rather than treating a laboratory test. Yeah. And, um, that's, I think that is, like I said, coming to be front and center. So that's pretty awesome. I can tell you a quick story. That's pretty interesting. Sure. In my clinic in Pennsylvania, we were in a suburb of Philadelphia. There's a lot of drug companies in that little band there on the New Jersey side in, in Trenton and Princeton and over in the Philadelphia side. And um, I had a patient who referred her father in. The father comes into the clinic, and it turns out, and I can't disclose who he is, so i got to watch how I say this, but sure. he worked <laughs> for one of the leading pharmaceutical companies as the vice president of research of that company, and he mm. invented their statin drug. So he came into my clinic. Oh, my goodness. Period. So my doctor and I walk up to him and my doctor says, oh, you're a bit of a celebrity. You, you invented blah, blah, blah. And he turned to us and said, I wouldn't take that crap. Really? We looked at him with our mouth open. He goes, they stuck me in a room with my competition, their product, and said, break a bond so we can get a patent and don't come out until you do. He said, I wouldn't put wow. that on my body. That's the problem. Wow. That's wow. The problem. Their product is focused on money, not outcomes. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh my goodness! That, isn't that that is, uh, man, that's irritating. Yeah, that's we've irritating. had multiple multiple vice presidents treat in our clinics over the years of of drug companies. Wow. See, the reason that's irritating is that happened in my family, a heart disease. My grandfather passed away; he's fifty seven years old. Oh, so. And to see what happens when somebody is 57, how many years life of your or years left of your life? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Like I'm how many years, how many years get taken away if you're passing away at 57? What does that do to a family much less? Exactly. Um, yeah. A, a career where you can be serving people. That is amazing. So, right. Oh right. my gosh. Ah. Well, Dr. Carberry, as we're wrapping up here, is there anything that you would like to mention uh, that we didn't talk about today? Anything that is on your heart, so to speak? Excuse me. I would just like to mention, again, how much I like the idea that your company is making these kits, because what it does is it gives good quality products to doctors in a format that's easy for them to be able to distribute for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it will enable more clinics to be able to provide a nutritional component, which is definitely needed in this country at this time. And I think that is definitely a brilliant move and the wave of the future. And I'm really glad you're providing those products. 
Well, awesome. So I'm glad to be working with those guys as well. Uh, Dr. Carberry, thank yeah. you for your time today. I understand you're a busy guy, and I appreciate you stopping by. Okay, thank you so much. All right. We'll have you back again if you'll have us. So that would be awesome. All right? That'd be fun. Okay, right. we'll see you. All right. Have a great day. You too.